Thousands of athletes are going for the gold. And as the clear champions of the bathroom, Dollar Shave Club deserves a gold medal. Dollar Shave Club has everything you need to look, smell, and feel your best. Shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, and of course, the best razors you'll ever use. You get an amazing high-quality shave every morning from the DSC Executive Razor, plus the true gold standard of any morning routine is their Dr. Carver Shave Butter. It helps the razor gently glide across your skin. Dollar Shave Club delivers everything to you. That means no more trips to the store, wandering the aisles, hunting for razors, shampoos, and toothpaste, and then playing cashier, scanning and bagging your stuff. Go for the gold. Join Dollar Shave Club today. And for just $5 with free shipping, you'll get the six-blade executive razor plus trial sizes of shave butter, body cleanser, and one-wipe Charlie's. Then keep the blades coming for a few bucks more a month. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash will. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash will. This is the Will Kane Podcast on ESPN Radio. What is going on in San Antonio? What's going on between Kawhi Leonard and the San Antonio Spurs? Despite all the talk of LeBron James and his potential moves this offseason, or perhaps the year after that, the quickest, most likely reordering of superstars in the NBA could be coming from the quietest of places. The loudest movement, the loudest boom to drop on the superstar shuffling in the NBA could come from San Antonio. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This morning at 10.46 a.m., an article from our own Adrian Wojnarowski dropped with the headline that reads this. Spurs' Kawhi Leonard has final say on return, opts to remain out. Kawhi Leonard has been medically cleared by the San Antonio Spurs to resume playing basketball, but he is not playing basketball. Why is that? Since the end of last season, he's been battling right quadricep tendinopathy, an injury that is nagging, plaguing, causing pain for Kawhi Leonard. He's only been able to get on the floor for nine games this season. But now the Spurs say he's healthy enough to play. But Kawhi Leonard has said, no, not yet. Last night, Greg Popovich addressed Leonard's future. I'll be surprised if he returns this season. Listen to that for just a second. I'll be surprised if he returns this season. Let me just get this straight. The reports are he's been medically cleared by the Spurs. Kawhi Leonard has been medically cleared to resume practice and resume play. He, it's on his plate, it's on Leonard's plate to manage his pain, manage his quadricep, decide when he's ready to play. And here's Greg Popovich saying he doesn't know if he's going to make it the rest of the season. I find that fascinating. I find the fact that the Spurs are saying he's healthy enough to play, but Popovich is saying, I don't know if he's going to play all season. Those two things don't match up. You're healthy enough to play. I don't know if he's going to play this season. That's Popovich saying something that he's not saying. I'll be surprised if he returns this season. You know, we only have X number of games left this season, and uh, he's still not ready to go. And you know, if by some chance he is, it's going to be pretty late into the season, and it's going to be a tough decision, you know, how late you bring somebody back. So I, I, that's why I'm just trying to be honest and logical. Uh, I'll be surprised if he gets back this year. Okay, there's no other way to read that than that is pressure. That's a threat. That is, unless you get on the floor like we think you can right now, we may not end up playing you this season. I think he sounds annoyed. With Kawhi Leonard. Yeah. I think he's saying, get on the floor soon or don't get on at all this season. The tension between the Spurs and Kawhi Leonard is fascinating. On one hand, you have got a guy who is known as a quiet guy, a hard worker, lunch pail guy. He's in this category of grit, puts in the work, doesn't cause a stink. That kind of guy gets the benefit of a doubt in any kind of drama, usually. On the other hand, you have essentially, and this is hard for me as a Dallas Mavericks fan, because in the mid-2000s there was some kind of intrastate rivalry. Obviously, any kind of rivalry like that, the Spurs would have won over the long run. But you have to acknowledge, even for a Dallas Mavericks fan, the San Antonio Spurs are a first-class organization in the NBA. So on one hand, you have... Lunch pail, hardworking, quiet player. On the other hand, you have first class organization, one that has scattered NBA championships over two decades, has something like, what are the Spurs up to? 
18 seasons or something of 50 straight wins. Some absurd number of seasons with over 50 wins. You have those two sides at odds with each other. Those two sides pulling apart. And it threatens to spin off one of the biggest superstars in the NBA. And it's over, I guess, well, it's over the handling of this injury for one. That much is clear. The Spurs say he's ready to play. Kawhi says he's not ready to play. When it comes to the benefit of the doubt on who, whose side do you believe in that scenario, I have a hard time not airing with the Spurs. I mean, they were in this exact scenario almost simultaneously to Kawhi. Tony Parker tore his quadricep at the end of last season. And he got back on the floor in seven months. I would assume, and it's not just an assumption, under the guidance of the Spurs medical staff. He went out in May, came back at the end of November. So if this is a first-class organization who has a history of bringing a guy back from a similar, if not worse, injury, and I recognize that all injuries are different, and an organization for that matter, by the way, have you ever seen what Popovich's record is without his superstars? It's just stupid. It's just absurd. He has at various times been without Kawhi, won over 60% of his games. Been without Tim Duncan, won over 60% of his games. Been without Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, won over 60% of his games. He went, and it was the smallest stretch, but he went for a time without David Robinson and won 77% of his games. At any given time, Greg Popovich, without his superstar, just keeps winning. I mean, this is the greatest coach of all time, right? This is the greatest professional coach of any sport, not just the NBA. I mean, that's the test right there. That's, that's got to be the greatest coach of all time. So they're at odds over how to handle the injury. But, you know, I was thinking about this and I was listening. Jalen Rose was on first take like a month ago. And he said something else about why the Spurs and Kawhi Parker, Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard are at odds with each other. And I asked you to grab this, Rudy. This is from a month ago. Listen to Jalen Rose on first take in January. Kawhi Leonard wants out of San Antonio. And the reason why, one is they've been unable to attract elite level all NBA caliber free agents to come play with him. The Spurs way looks like opportunity dressed in overalls. It looks like work. And people really don't want that. Players talk about wanting to win and wanting to be a champion. But ultimately, they want to do it on their own terms. And when you go to San Antonio, guess who's the CEO of that organization? Greg Popovich is going to be his way. And also, the way his injury situation was handled. You see him in the lineup. You see him out of the lineup. Is it his quad? What's going on with his history? Was he misdiagnosed? Well, first, I don't, is Jalen right? I don't, the Spurs have been able to attract top level free agents. I mean, the year that Lamarcus Aldridge was on the market, he was the biggest name free agent and chose San Antonio. So I don't know that they've been unable to bring free agents to play alongside Kawhi Leonard. They got LaMarcus Aldridge to do just that. But could this be it? Between the handling of the injury and the idea that Kawhi might want out of San Antonio, we might be seeing, what is Kawhi? By most accounts, a top five player in the NBA? Potentially shifting teams? Where does he go? I got three trade scenarios for you because you I love this stuff. Oh. There's three options for me. It's the Sixers, the Lakers, and the Celtics. Which one do you want first? I want the least interesting first. Let's go from Sixers to Celtics to Lakers. All right, Sixers. This would be three players. Markel Fultz, Dario Saric, and Robert Covington. Would you do that trade for Kawhi Leonard? Who says no? The Spurs say no to that. Really? Is it because of Fultz? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. If Fultz is healthy, I think you kind of, I think that's a, that's a good haul. The Spurs say no to that. Okay. Celtics, what do you got? Jason Tatum. One of Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. One of those two. Probably Jason Tatum. Let's just say that because he's probably the better player, I think we think. Marcus Morris and the Lakers unprotected pick ne- uh, protected pick next year. So basically, they only get that pick if it falls between two and five. That might be a ringer. That might be the deal. That's really? very Well, that's reminiscent of the Kyrie deal. You but get it, a big-time player, bigger than Isaiah Thomas, by the way, getting Jason Tatum or... Jalen Brown would be huge. I'd want Tatum, I think, by the way. Yeah, probably. You'd probably want Tatum and that pick. But that pick is so risky. But you have to get some. There's got to be some coverage there. If we don't get this pick, it turns into what it does the next yeah, year, that's, right? That's probably the highest it could be is that is 2-5. to five. After that, it's probably outside the lottery. All right, what do you got for the Lakers? Lakers, Brandon Ingram, and Kyle Kuzma. 
make the money work? The, uh, I guess the Spurs say no to that deal, but that's a pretty even haul right there. That's as close as you're going to get to two young players you can build around without it being a draft pick. If Kawhi Leonard is on the market, it'll be one of the, I mean, that's bigger than Kyrie. That'll reset what a superstar gets. We're in the dark here. We're in the dark on that trade, on what that could possibly get. And it just proves that you need to have the assets ready because this happens every couple of years. And if you have the assets ready, you can make this trade. More likely than LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard moving teams. The Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Home Insurance. Getting a quote is now easier than ever. I just said this. Greg Popovich, the greatest modern era pro coach of all time. If I say modern era and all time, I can't say both. That's things, an oxymoron. Right? Yep. Yeah. Modern era pro sports. We don't want to go back to our back and whatever. Let's just keep it. Don't there. bring Lombardi an hour back because this is all I'm telling you all sports greatest coach greatest pros coach of all time or in the modern era it's the Will Kane show on ESPN radio and the ESPN app what's up everyone Will Kane here support for the Will Kane podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans chances are you're confident when it comes to your work your hobbies and your life Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan with Rocket Mortgage you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash will. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. The doctors are saying Kawhi Leonard can play, and Kawhi Leonard is saying, no, I can't. When you hear cleared to play and player not playing, the antenna goes up. You can't guarantee the contracts in football for that, that very reason. reason. They're guaranteeing basketball in a way that has made the players more powerful than they have ever been. Feels like the Spurs are pushing him to play when he's telling them, I can't play. See how fast you fracture the trust of one of your franchise players if that's what you're doing. See how fast I get out there if I was making $22 million. Yeah, imagine this scenario in football. I mean, you can't because it just wouldn't happen in the NFL. You're healthy enough to play, you're on the field. If not, the organization would just start talking about signing bonuses, recouping money. It would be an all-out war if an NFL team said, you can play, and you said, I cannot. Kawhi Leonard, though, is telling the San Antonio Spurs, despite what their doctors say, he's not ready. He's not ready to play. The real question is whether or not he's going to play for the San Antonio Spurs, period. The real question is, as Greg Popovich said, first... Will he play this season? I'll be surprised if he returns this season. And second, if he plays with the San Antonio Spurs over the long haul. Kawhi Leonard wants out of San Antonio. These are the questions not playing when you're medically cleared to play bring up. It's time for Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Corey in West Virginia, you're on the Will Kane Show. What's up, Corey? Hey, how you doing, Will? Good. So, uh, first off, I want to say I'm on the road every day when your show's on me. I love you. I find myself agreeing with you about 75% of the time. <laughs> I'll take 75%. That's a huge win for me. You don't understand. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, here's my thought. You know, when David Robinson was on his way out, and, and I'm a Spurs fan, so I'm going to try to be as, as unbiased as I can about this. Um, when Dave, when uh, the Admiral was on his way out, they bring in Tim Duncan. That's the future, you know. The Admiral retires. Tim Duncan's the future. If something like this would have happened with Timmy D., it's almost like the San, San Antonio would have sat down and done just about anything, if not anything, to keep Tim Duncan there and keep Tim Duncan happy. That's mm-hmm. their future. That's their, that's their man. Mm-hmm. So Tim Duncan's on his way down. They bring in Kawhi Leonard. And, and you, I mean, look, Kawhi and Tim Duncan both put on, like you said, lunch pail guys go out there. They do the fundamentals. They but what's your hard, point? The San Antonio just keeps getting lucky that one superstar goes away and the next one steps up. It just works out for everybody no. in San Antonio? No, no, no. My point is, how, who's to say that San Antonio isn't going to sit down if Kawhi is unhappy and say, look, we're going to do what we need to do to keep you here, just like we did with Tim Duncan. You're a future. You're our guy right now. Plus, Tony, you know, is getting up in his years. They're building around Kawhi, and that's their future. So even if Kawhi does one out, I feel that San Antonio is going to sit down and within a pretty big margin give Kawhi just about what he wants to keep him there and keep him happy. Well, it's the NBA, Corey. I appreciate the call. It's the NBA. They can throw all the money in the world they want at him. But if he feels like San Antonio is no longer the place for him, for whatever reason, and we've heard essentially two, I'll give you a third. We've heard the mishandling of the injury. Okay, let's say they work all that out. Second, we go to Jalen's reason, that they can't attract star free agents to play by beside Kawhi Leonard. I'm skeptical of that because they already did it with LaMarcus Aldridge. I'm, but maybe they can't find any more, and they need more to be real contenders. The third reason, I think, that you could anticipate Kawhi Leonard wanting out is because... 
And this isn't mean to San Antonio, and this isn't mean to the Spurs organization. The lights just aren't as bright. It's not as bright as playing in some place like L.A. or some place like Boston. They're just not. San Antonio is a dynasty. San Antonio is a model organization. And San Antonio should get worlds more attention than they have. But they just don't. And that can start to bother Kawhi Leonard at some point. By the way, how? here's the real. He brought up, you know, you go from David Robinson to Tim Duncan to Tony Parker to Manu Ginobili to Kawhi Leonard. It is like the San Antonio Spurs are just blessed from one star player to the next. They all overlap, and there's where your championships come in. But the real secret, obviously, is Greg Popovich. And there's a lot about Popovich that rubs me wrong. I think the whole bit about being mean to sideline reporters is not funny. I think it's worn, and I think it's curmudgeonly, and I don't like it. It it rubs me the wrong way. It's just, you're rude. You're not funny. Number two, I don't need Greg Popovich's political opinions at every press conference. I don't need him. I don't, I'm not interested, and I don't really like that he takes those opportunities to give me his political opinions on every point of view. But that's not going to stop me from recognizing the fact, Greg Popovich, I think he's the greatest pro coach of all time. I'm talking football, I'm talking basketball, baseball, whatever you want. You know, Bum Bum Phillips, who was the famous coach for the Houston Oilers back in the day, said, you know, what? I I never get this completely right. He can beat you with his and then swap teams and beat you with yours. Meaning it didn't matter which players he had. He could swap sidelines and he'd still beat you. That's how good a coach he was. And I don't remember who Bum Phillips is referencing. But Greg Pop—I mean, Greg Popovich has shown take away his star player and he still performs. Now, he's got other good players, but how many people can you say that about? You can't. We don't know with Belichick. Belichick is great, but he's inextricably tied to Tom Brady. He did have one season where Matt Castle had a good record, but it didn't go that far. That's all we've got with Belichick. Every other instance of Belichick is tied to Brady. So we can't separate what's driving that. But we can with Popovich. I, I mean, I had this in front of me. They're third in the West this year. They're 35-24. and 24. And that's with Kawhi Leonard only playing nine games. They've won 60% of the games without Kawhi. That's just stunning to me, and it's every time he loses. Tim Duncan, he went 71-47 and 47 without Tim Duncan. Again, 60%. Tony Parker, 100 wins to 54 losses, over 60%. With Tony Parker out. Same thing with Manu Ginobili. 65%. And without David Robinson, 78%. You take away the star, and he still wins. I mean, who else can you say that about? You can't say that about Phil Jackson. I mean, Phil Jackson would be one of the great rebuttals. It's probably Bill Belichick and Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson had Michael Jordan for his Chicago run and Shaq and Kobe for his L.A. run. You can never go, well, you know, without a superstar... This is what he looked like. Or without his biggest star, it's what he looked like. Greg Popovich is the one that satisfies the Bum Phillips standard. By the way, he was talking about Bear Bryant. He was talking about Bear Bryant? Yeah. He was talking about a college coach? Yeah. I don't want to go to college. I know. We'll just keep this pro. I I have one note, too, by the way, just to piggyback off of you. We go to college, Nick Saban might beat this. Yeah, that's that's probably where it's tough. Coach K, who knows. But... You talk about stars and his record without stars. That's all well and fine, but you need stars to win titles. And that's, I'm not going to hold that against you, but the thing that is amazing about Popovich is he won his first title in 99 with the Spurs. His best player was Robinson. He won three titles, 03, 05, and 07. His best player was Tim Duncan. And the latest title was 2014. He won with Kawhi. That's three different star players right. that he's won with. Belichick's got one. And you could say Belichick's a great coach, and I, I don't deny that he is, but Pop has proven he can do it with three different guys. I guess you could say Phil Jackson showed he can do it with two different regimes as well, but this three different individual stars that your team is centered that around. That he's developed, too. Man, I give it to him begrudgingly. As a Mavs fan, as a guy who doesn't think he's funny on the sidelines, and as a guy who doesn't want his political views, I give it to him begrudgingly. This is the greatest coach of all time in pro sports. In pro sports. I don't want to do the Nick Saban thing. Not right now. Coming up, Tim Hasselbeck tells me, if the Eagles coach Doug Peterson might have offended his star quarterback, 
I'll let you decide which one I'm talking about. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Now ADT can help protect your family at home and on the go. Get started with ADT's best offer. An ADT starter kit and security camera installed free. A $449 savings plus you'll get ADT Go, the new family mobile safety app and service with 24-7 emergency response. Go to ADT.com slash podcast today to take advantage of ADT's best offer. With 36-month monitoring contract, easy pay and QSP. Early termination and activation fees apply. Additional charge for ADT Go premium services after March 31st, 2000. 2018. Certain markets excluded. Licenses available at ADT.com. Offer ends April 1st. I mean, the other name I'm getting on Twitter about greatest coach of all time outside of Greb Kopovich is Scotty Bowman. Hockey. Hockey guy. Hockey. That's Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Nationwide coverage on America's largest, most dependable 4G LTE networks. So I was on first take today and got into a little argument with Stephen A. about whether or not Doug Peterson, who went on the Rich Eisen show, Rich Eisen's radio show, and said that the Eagles would have won the Super Bowl with Carson Wentz at quarterback. In fact, Carson Wentz would have won the MVP. And I think that's incredibly insulting to Nick Foles. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be insulted. They have their own personal relationship. But I think, number one, Peterson's wrong. And number two... It's pretty insulting to what Nick Foles actually did. And then I was going through my sound sheets and listening to what happened on Golik and Wingo. And I was like, oh, look at this. Tim Hasselbeck says I'm wrong. So now, Tim Hasselbeck on the Shell Pinzo performance line. It's not insulting what Dick Doug Peterson said, Tim? Why is it, why is it insulting to Nick Foles? Because well, why should he be insulted by that? It negates the amazing individual performance that he that he put on the field in both not just the Super Bowl but the NFC Championship game. Carson Wentz literally couldn't have been better in those two games. But maybe he was just as good. Maybe he would have been just as good. But here, tell me this. What was the Eagles record when Carson got hurt? 11 and 2. I help you. I, 11 and there 2. There you go. 11 <laughs> and 2. Okay. Yeah. Right, so they're eleven and two. Listen to that smile. I can hurt. hear the smile on your face. Why? Did you think you got me or something it's, with that? It's actually a shit. Well, I was going to help you out. I know it's a new show. I don't know what kind of staff you have there to look up stats, but you probably have them off the top of your head. Look, he was in, he was a league MVP candidate. Why Doug Peterson, My Carson t- Wentz, anybody on that roster, including Nick Foles, would think that Carson Wentz could not play as well as Nick Foles? Uh, play during that stretch, maybe even a little bit better. Oh. Or why wouldn't why wouldn't you think he could do that? Well, okay, two points. Thank you for the chance to re- to rebut what mm-hmm. you've laid out. Uh, first of all, the NFL history, Super Bowl history, is littered with quarterbacks who were MVP, not just candidates, but MVP winners yeah. during the regular season, from Joe Theismann to Cam do you, Newton. Do you think Do you think Carson would have won it had he stayed healthy and just continued on that pace? I don't know. I think it changes the dynamic. I truly do, Tim. Like I think the whole, if Carson Wentz is the starting quarterback for the Eagles in that Super Bowl, no, do you think he would have? Hold won on, hold on. I think they're the. I think they're the favorite. If he's the quarterback, I think mm-hmm. they're the favorite. And then I think that whole motivation and and ethos of the team of being underdogs and wearing dog masks around. I think that's gone. If Carson, so how much is that to play? I think you're well, yeah. in the end. I, I think, think you're taking away saved. reality. I don't think they'd be. I don't think they'd be favorited over the New England Patriots and all the experience that they had and Brady. Ooh. And I, I don't think they would have been favorited, but I, they would not have been as much of an underdog. I will grant you that, and I will grant you that. You know, maybe you can't play it up as much, and you know there there is just a general dynamic that gets changed. I, I get that. I, I don't think that it's. You know, I and I and and I'm. You know, in your defense of you know the you know somewhat insane take that you had on it, <laughs> is that you don't think that is that you don't think that Nick Foles is uh, is or would be offended by it no. um, personally, be, in in large part because of the relationship between the, the two quarterbacks. So I would add, I heard you say um, that, and I think you're spot on there. I'm just saying I think it's on its face somewhat insulting to what Nick Foles did in reality. Yeah, I guess what I'd say is let's say that Doug Peterson comes on the Will Kane show and you say. Man, you know, everyone thought you know was, the season was over when uh, Carson Wentz got hurt. You know, does the season turn out differently if he's healthy? What do you think Doug Peterson would say to you? Yeah, I, th- he's doing a PC answer, taking up for his guy, making Carson feel better about the fact he missed out on starting in a Super Bowl. I know what he's doing. Yeah, I know what he's doing. Yeah. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So that's how that works. You go, you go out trying sure. to be nice, and you end up insulting people. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of these things where it's like, hey, 
you know, tell me, you know, you know, who's whatever, you know, the best basketball player of all time. It's like, well, you're offending somebody that was really, really great. Touche. <laughs> you know I mean? Touche. No yes. you're, you're not doing that. But like, if I say Jordan's better than LeBron, should LeBron really be insulted by that? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait a second. How'd you leave out Larry Bird? I could have sworn that was going to be your answer. What does that mean? Why? I mean, what are you doing? That, don't subtweet me on my gonna, Are you doing a race thing? What are you doing here? I thought you, no, I'm just saying I thought you were going to say Larry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> if you were in studio right now, this would be the next 20 minutes of the show. <laughs> I heard you this morning. I'm going to ask you to translate some things from me, okay? Okay. You were talking about Baker Mayfield. You're talking about Sam Darnold. So you can put these terms into the context of whoever you want here. I think you were talking about Darnold when you said this decision making you question some of the decision making will you translate decision making into layman yeah. terms well no i mean i think when you're talking about decision making look your quarter your job as a quarterback is to throw it to the open guy mm -hmm. and you know you don't just catch the ball in the shotgun and look out there aimlessly find somebody open and throw it to him that's not how it works you get clues pre-snap you know first of all you study during the week you get a sense of what you're going to face you get clues pre-snap there's probably some type of you know movement or rotation or adjustment post snap, and so as a quarterback, it's your job to read the coverage. Are you getting blitzed? Do you have a protection issue? Um, you know, is, is the safety roll over the top? Are they, you know, clouding the corner? What, what are they doing? You're getting information so that you can make the right decision to throw to the guy that is open based on the design of the play and who should be getting free. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, I don't think that Sam Darnold's a, a bad decision maker. I I, I would make the I, I think that uh, Josh Allen. I don't come away with. Um, you may have been like talking he's about a Allen. tremendous. Yeah, you may be talking about. He's a tremendous him. decision maker because um, I because I I didn't find that watching him on tape. Okay. Um, and so I think we're probably talking about Josh Allen. Mel Kiper has his number one going to Cleveland, and I've watched all of these guys and. I I don't think that, in my opinion, he's the best quarterback prospect in this class. I think that if people have him rated that high, I think there's a chance that people are falling in love with just the sheer arm strength, which I believe is the biggest um, you know trait that can fool you in a quarterback evaluation. Is you fall in love with a guy's ability to just rip it, right? And there's a lot more to play in the position, you know, beyond that. Okay, I'm going to ask you. I've got like a minute here, Tim. But um, mm -hmm. the other term you used um, that I want you to uh, translate for me is anticipation. How's that different from yeah. decision making? And I think that time you were talking about Baker, maybe Baker Mayfield and anticipation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I think I could have been talking about Allen as well. You obviously did a poor job of listening to that segment. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I didn't think that Josh. Allen I was thinking was about really Larry Bird. Good, yeah, yeah. I anticipate it, you know. And so he, what he does is he waits to see it open. And then he tries to fire it, you know, and, you know, in the NFL, guys recover and close too quickly. And so the, you have to anticipate, you have to throw early anticipating where a guy is going to be. And so I do think Baker plays with pretty good anticipation. Um, I, I think that Sam Darnold at the time plays with good anticipation. Same thing with Josh Rosen. And so you know, I think the anticipation some of those guys have shown, but, you know, kind of better than, Josh Allen. So I guess you know. I think my conversation this morning was really based around. I'm surprised you're just down on Allen. Have him it was all about one. Allen. Not that I'm down on him. I just think these other guys do some of these things that are important better than him. Right. Okay. I listened, man. By the way, I mean, you say I like uh, Larry Bird. I know you like Mason Rudolph. You're super big on Mason Rudolph. I heard. I was listening. See. Well, you know, and you know what? I, don't tell me I about it. I don't have time. <laughs> Well, I thought you were going to ask me about Lamar Jackson, and we were going to get into that a little bit. What position he might play? Do you want to? Do you want to talk you know about? What? I got to take a commercial I break. I have I'll to take... come back. Then. Okay, I'll good. Back. I listen. I know you're signing up affiliate, so you got to go to break. <laughs> but when you're done, uh, I'm putting I'll W's on the board. I'm do I'm going to put a few W's on the board, and then come back and get your take on Lamar Jackson. All right. ESPN NFL analyst Tim Hassel back on the Shell Pinzo Performance Line. That's straight ahead. Never expected that Lamar Jackson would be the guy that everyone would be arguing about. Josh Rosen, the UCLA Bruins, projected to drop to the Miami Dolphins. Help Eli, help that offense. Don't go for the heir apparent. But everybody is arguing about Lamar Jackson. That's what the debate has been ever since Bill Polian said he's better suited at wide receiver 
than he is at quarterback in the NFL. Yesterday, we had Booger McFarland on the program. We had Matt Miller on the program. And the bottom line is this. Is Lamar Jackson a good enough prospect to play quarterback in the NFL? And we had an honest discussion yesterday, by the way, with Booger McFarland. You can go check that out on the Will Cain Show podcast on iTunes or on the ESPN app about how much race has to do with that conversation. How, for some reason, Lamar Jackson's ability as a pro quarterback has turned into a conversation about race. And somebody that really wanted to get in on that conversation was ESPN NFL analyst Tim Hasselbeck on the Shell Pins Old Performance Line. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app and join and start saving five cents a gallon today. In fact, you even hung on through the commercial break because you were so excited to give me your Lamar Jackson take. Well, yeah, I do feel like I kind of muffled my way into the segment, kind of like my 30 set pull up. But, um, <laughs> what, what, no, no one knows what you're talking about. That. I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to talk about Lamar Jackson in this regard, but I'll tell you, like, I think it's bothersome that it kind of turned into kind of such a discussion about race because I don't think it has anything to do with race. You know, um, I think it has to do with, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what the guy could do best you know, in the National Football League. You kind of said, you know, is he um, a good enough prospect to play quarterback in the NFL? Like, the answer to that question is 100% yes, it is. And All right. Bill, Polian, Bill Polian would agree with that assessment. He is a prospect in the NFL as a quarterback, totally. Um, I think what Bill was saying, and I think in some ways, you know, unfortunate to him with how it kind of got positioned, was that you know I think Bill sees him as a uh, as a brighter prospect as a wide receiver and I don't know Tim hold on I had Bill in studio and he was pretty salty I and aggressive him, with I, me listen I t- I talked to Bill about it yesterday I worked with him yesterday and I said you know he has I don't want to speak for him but he has a place in mind where he would draft him as a quarterback and he has a place in mind where he would draft him as a receiver and I can tell you. He would draft him higher as a receiver from the conversation I had with him. So Bill does not think that he's incapable of playing quarterback in the NFL in that some you know obscure guy that gets drafted in the sixth round is a better pro quarterback prospect than Lamar Jackson. That's just not accurate okay. with how Bill feels about right. it. Well, how do you feel? So, how good is he? I think that he's a um, – look, my evaluation of him would be that I would let him – fail at trying to play quarterback because I think that his upside is Michael Vick. I know that people have made that comparison. He, when he is out there, he is the oftentimes the fastest player on the field, which was exactly the case for Michael Vick. And he's a better passer than Vick was at Virginia Tech. That, that is true at this point. Um, his running, I never thought of the Antonio Brown comparison, which Bill made. But his running, there, there, are, there is evidence of why you would think that and why people like Bill, who's evaluated players for a long time, would come to that conclusion that there's similarities there. Would and, you? Would you? And let me tell you, and let, let's just be really clear about that. That's right. a massive compliment. That's a huge compliment to somebody in that his athletic ability. It has nothing to do with race. You're not going to make that comparison to Josh Rosen because he doesn't have a skill set. He's not able to do that. So. That's why it's there. In terms of him as a pastor, here's the deal. Um, I believe that there's enough evidence that there is promise for him as a pastor and somebody in the pocket. I showed video today. You know, he's playing Syracuse. There was bad weather. You know, he does a nice job. Gets center gets beat. You know, kind of a Tom Brady move in the pocket, reset, deliver an accurate throw. He is not eager to get outside the pocket and run. I, I made this comparison. Sam Darnold is more eager to escape and use his running ability than Lamar Jackson is on passing play. He just Lamar Jackson's perfectly comfortable staying in the pocket and throwing. He, would he you, doesn't. He's not. Would you not spend a first round that. pick on him as a quarterback? Um, it depends. The rest of my roster, um, like I, I wouldn't. Um, like it depends on everyone would have to be on board with what we were doing. Were you playing him right away? Are you comfortable with him sitting? Are you comfortable not having a special package for him and just letting him learn the position? And quite honestly, are you okay if it's not coming along the way you want it to in two years to to do something else? Like like that that would impact me on that. But like 
Lamar Jackson should be drafted. In my estimation, there's no reason that Lamar – like Lamar Jackson, I believe, will definitely be drafted before the second round is over as a quarterback. Are you going to tell everybody that those 35 pull-ups you did were mostly butterfly pull-ups? I mean, most people didn't see the video, and you were swinging from, on most of them? Are you going to explain that you were kipping, like, out of sight, and most people said you did two pull-ups? Were you allowed to? Were you allowed to kip or not? Who what did more doing? strict pull-ups, me or you? You did. Who weighs 117 pounds? <laughs> not me. You do. <laughs> I, okay? don't. I don't. Know if you, I don't know if your listeners know this, but like they probably think of like, oh, maybe this is some like cowboy type Texan on a. They don't realize that like you're. You're kind of like a like a 117 pound Ivy Leaguer. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, kind of like. Probably when people met Tom Cruise, and they're like, whoa, I thought he'd be way taller than that, you know? I'm 6'2", 170, and I've never lived in the oh, Northeast until really? I got well, this job. I want to see you standing next to Lamar Jackson. He's 210. <laughs> I got to go. I, you have to go. No, you have to go. Yeah, Mark Cuban, yeah. straight ahead. Thank you for listening to the Will Kane Podcast. You can listen to the Will Kane Show live weekdays at 3 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on the ESPN app. The Will Kane Podcast. Thousands of athletes are going for the gold. And as the clear champions of the bathroom, Dollar Shave Club deserves the gold medal. Dollar Shave Club has everything you need to look, smell, and feel your best. Shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, and of course, the best razors you'll ever use. You get an amazing, high-quality shave every morning from the DSC Executive Razor, plus the true gold standard of any morning routine is their Dr. Carver Shave Butter. It helps the razor gently glide across your skin. Dollar Shave Club delivers everything to you. That means no more trips to the store, wandering the aisles, hunting for razors, shampoos, and toothpaste, and then playing cashier, scanning, and bagging your stuff. Go for the gold. Join the Dollar Shave Club today. And for just $5 with free shipping, you'll get the six-blade executive razor plus trial sizes of shave butter, body cleanser, and one-wipe Charlie's. Then keep the blades coming for a few bucks more a month. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash will. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash will. This is the Will Kane Podcast on ESPN Radio. What did he know? How much did he know? And what should happen to the Dallas Mavericks? Those are the three questions swirling around Mark Cuban today. And the article from sportsillustrated.com yesterday that lays out allegations of sexual harassment misogyny, in some cases, hiring individuals who had histories of domestic assault inside the Dallas Mavericks. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. How much did he know and what should happen? Those are our two questions. Let's start backwards. Let's start with what should happen first. What kind of punishment could be imposed upon Mark Cuban and the Dallas Mavericks if it is found out that he was aware and tolerant of an environment that allowed Terdima Usuri to commit sexual harassment over 18 years. Because that's the real key here. There's two instances. There's two individuals at fault right now. There's the DallasMavs.com writer who was hired with a history of domestic violence and had an incident of domestic violence while an employee of the Dallas Mavs. Mark Cuban has taken blame. He has said, that was my call. It was a bad call. I kept this guy on staff and I did it without knowing all the dirty details of what he did. That, number one, is an instance and and an individual that Mark Cuban has taken responsibility for. But the one that's really going to indict him, the one that's really going to be the one that could potentially rain down punishment on the Dallas Mavericks and Mark Cuban is that of the president of the Dallas Mavericks, his number two in command, Terdima Usuri, who was accused of creating an environment that women were afraid to go to work, where women jogging in Dallas on the trails in Dallas, talking to each other. And one turns to the other and says, I just got hired at the Mavericks. The other three would say, watch out for the president. Don't be caught alone in the elevator with the president. How much of that did Mark Cuban know? Because if he knew a lot, we're talking about punishment that could already go up to the Donald Sterling, Jerry Richardson, sell the franchise level. Now, why do I know we're talking about that? It's already been mentioned. And you know, you know as well as I do will get there faster than you can blink. In fact, this is Ian Fitzsimmons, an ESPN radio host, last night talking about that very possibility. If evidence comes out that he knew what was going on 
with Tredeem Ossery, his then CEO and president, Commissioner Adam Silver, if hard evidence does come out Mm -hmm. that Cuban did have knowledge of this, Adam Silver has to take a good hard look at mandating for Mark Cuban to sell the Dallas Mavericks. Sell the Dallas Mavericks. If Mark Cuban knew what was going on, should he be forced to sell the Dallas Mavericks? I got to tell you, I'm extremely uncomfortable with this reaction, this extent. Look, we talked about this yesterday when it comes to punishment. It seems like in order to prove your virtue, in order to prove that you're opposed to something, you have to be the first to call for the stiffest penalty. If you and I are both talking about the fact that we're opposed to trespassing, but you're the one that calls for the death penalty for those that trespass, you seem to win. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm against trespassing, but geez, the death penalty? Do we force people to sell the franchise whenever there is something going on that everyone can condemn? Everyone can say was wrong. Tim Kalishaw, a writer for the Dallas Morning News and a radio host at ESPN in Dallas, he wrote a column in Dallas Morning News saying the punishment for the Mavericks could look something like this. It could be the forfeiture of their first round draft pick. The Mavs are tanking. Mark Cuban's admitted they're tanking. He did it yesterday, or two days ago, to Julius Irving on his new podcast. Probably not supposed to say this, but like, I just had dinner with a bunch of our guys the other night, mm-hmm. and here we are. We, you know, we weren't competing for the playoffs. I was like, look, losing is our best option. You know, Adam would hate, hate <laughs> right, hearing right. that, but I, at least. And there, for that, for that little moment on that podcast, he was fined six hundred thousand dollars. For his honesty, he was fined six hundred thousand dollars. I mean, he's only doing what everyone else in the NBA in a losing proposition does, what 30% of the teams right now are doing. His guilt is honesty. That's his sin. Lose a draft pick? Lose your first-round draft pick? For what's going on inside the Dallas Mavericks? Forced to sell the franchise? It's like Mark Cuban knew this moment was coming. If you remember, and I talked about this this morning on the Dan Lebitard show, and Sarudi and I were talking about it in our prep today, when the NBA forced Donald Sterling to sell his franchise for racist and bigoted and horrendous remarks. Mark Cuban was somebody that raised his hand and goes, ah, this is dangerous. This is a slippery slope. Listen. Adam will deal with that within the Constitution of the NBA, and I'm all for him taking those steps. But in terms of should we kick him out you know, and go outside of the Constitution, should we start taking steps to, to really condemn people for what they say in the privacy of their own home that just happens to be recorded? That's a slippery slope I don't want to get on. If it was one of my companies and I saw that somebody thought like that and dealt like that, I'd fire them. But that's within my companies. That's within my organization. I have the control at that particular point. But again, generally speaking, where do you draw the line? That's an incredibly slippery slope. Okay, that sound is fascinating. That's from 2014. Three quick points. Number one, Mark, you're on the slippery slope. You are now firmly on that slippery slope. Number two, I agree. I'm very uncomfortable with our lack of definition of when somebody is forced to sell their franchise. Because without standards and without ideas of when we know that's going to happen, we're left with this. The one that really guides us is how mad is the mob? Do you have enough people mad at you? It's really not about right or wrong. We all agree what's going on inside the Dallas Mavericks is wrong. But it's like that calling for the death penalty for trespassing. Is it always that we have to call for the harshest punishment to prove that we're against something? The one that seems to guide us, the only principle we have left is, is is the mob mad? And mobs can be righteous. Mobs can be right. They can be correct. But they can just as easily, just as simply be wrong. That's not a guiding principle. Enough people being mad. Here's Mark still in 2014 talking about Donald Sterling losing his franchise. In this country, people are allowed to be morons. They're allowed to be stupid. They're allowed to think idiotic thoughts. And, you know, within an organization like the NBA, um, we try to do what's in the best interest of the league. And that's why we have a commissioner and a constitution. And I think Adam will, will, you know, be smart and, you know, deal with Donald to the full extent available to him. But again, in terms of just saying a blanket, let's kick him out. I don't want to go that far because that it's not about Donald. It's not about his position. It's about who's next. It looks like it could be Mark Cuban this next. Now, nobody is really, I I say nobody, but this is already being talked about. Could this be a potential punishment for Mark Cuban? One more thing on this idea of ugly beliefs or beliefs that you disagree with, and those are two very different things. I I got into this this morning on First Take with 
with Max Kellerman because he referenced this line, this paragraph in the SI.com article. There were many people at fault in what's going on in the Dallas Mavericks organization. Obviously, the bad actors themselves, the writer at Mavs.com, the president, Tradima Usuri, and by the way, the head of HR, who either ignored, kept this stuff from Mark Cuban, or didn't allow sexual harassment claims to come to him. But there's this paragraph here where it says, the guy's name was, I think it was Billy Pittman. His last name is Pittman. Pittman had been known to take strong positions on social and political issues such as abortion and immigration, sending charged email messages to select staffers and friends that leave little doubt where he stands. One email obtained by SA.com forwarded, the title was, The Best Response to Gay Marriage I've Seen. And the email bristled with, bristled at the widespread acceptance of Jason Collins' announcement that he is gay. So Pittman's overt social and religious leanings, I'm reading still from SI.com, have a chilling effect on the willingness to approach him with sensitive workplace issues, say some former Mavs employees. I mean, listen, it is such a stretch, an inappropriate one at that, to say someone's political beliefs are somehow tolerant of sexual harassment claims, that someone might be socially conservative, opposed to abor- abortion, even opposed to gay marriage. And by the way, I'm not telling you my opinions on these things. By the way, they're out there. You're easy to find. It's not as ca- crackerjack box and easy to ascertain as you might think. But I know this. There is no political point of view that is somehow connected to tolerance of sexual harassment. I don't understand what the HR representative, an HR representative who should have been fired, who obviously wasn't good at his job, who was culpable in this entire incident, but what his political beliefs have to do with any of it. It's like we're always in an effort to demonize those who disagree with us. This time there is a guy worth demonizing, but his disagreement isn't the point. I want to continue having this Mark Cuban conversation, and I want to have it in really some honest ways that I don't think a lot of people are having it. I want to have it in ways where we can explore how something like this could happen. I want to bring in a friend of mine, Molly Karam, to hang out for that conversation, push back on some of my thoughts, and get somewhere that not a lot of people are willing to get to. Straight ahead on the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. What's up, everyone? Will Kane here. Support for the Will Kane Podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash will, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. This is going to be uncomfortable for Mark Cuban. These women said, listen, I went in the real locker room and I was treated with courtesy like a professional. I'd go to my desk and that's when the, the zoo began. They're saying that it was an open secret. That's what was taking place within the Dallas Mavericks organization. This was acceptable workplace behavior. Former president for the Dallas Mavericks. He's in a world of trouble. I've met and spoken to Dordima Ossery on several occasions. If these allegations are true... He's disgusting. I told you there's two questions that need to be answered, two ways to approach what's going on with the Dallas Mavericks and Mark Cuban. Number one, how much did he know? When did he know it? And number two, what could be the potential punishment? The conversation we just had talked about what that potential punishment could be. I mean, could it be forced to sell the franchise? Could we be looking at a Jerry Richardson, Donald Sterling type situation? Could be forfeiture of their first round draft pick, which the Mavericks are currently tanking to improve. But the first question I said I wanted to save, how much did he know? When did he know it? Because that's the one that sets up the punishment. Like, how guilty is Mark Cuban? And I want to have that conversation with a friend of mine, somebody I trust. I want to have an open and honest conversation with the host of First Take, Molly Karam on the Shell Pins Old Performance Line. Thanks, Molly. Hi, Will. How are we doing? I'm good. Listen, so let's kind of walk through this for a minute. Um, Okay. How much did Mark Cuban know? I want to tell you what I think is sort of the fuzzy line here and see what you think of this. Sh- sure. There's I a think lot it's, to unpack. <laughs> well, you heard me this morning on First Take. I think it's impossible mm-hmm. that he didn't know something. I just don't think that Tardima Usuri can be walking around your building as your number two with this many incidents supposedly going on, and Mark Cuban is completely ignorant of that. But what mm-hmm. did he know is the key to me. And, you know, here's the key. It's in the dirty details. You can read it in the SI.com article. Did he know that Terdima Usuri was putting his hands on women during meetings? Like, There's reports that he reached over and put his hand on their thigh. 
Did he know that he went up to women and said, I know what you're going to be doing this weekend. You're going to be doing sex acts that I can't repeat on the air right now. Did mm-hmm. he know those details or did he think and hear and suspect that Tardima Usri was a guy who flirted and hit on women and made passes at women consistently? It seems to me what that line, Molly, to me kind of mm-hmm. seems significant. Is that am I off mm-hmm. there? I think you're a bit off. Um, I think his level of culpability does depend on his awareness, but I do feel like we know enough at this point. So, so let's get into what we do know. And I'd say there's four characters here right now. We've got the, the Mav.com reporter, Earl K. Sneed, the CEO and president, Tradema, and then the head of HR, Buddy Pittman, and then, of course, Mark Cuban. So what we do know is that Mark Cuban hired Earl K. Sneed as the Mav.com's reporter with a history of domestic violence. Well, he couldn't even travel to Canada because of it. Then he started dating a girl who also worked for the franchise and he abused her. Then Mark chose to keep him on the staff. So I find that egregious. Yes, he apologized for that. So that's the first strike right there. Now we get into the Tredema situation, which is by far the worst of them all. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but he had been investigated in 1998 for these same type of issues. And they chose to keep him on staff. Which was before Mark Cuban bought the team. I am aware. You're right. And and that's before Mark Cuban bought the team. Mm -hmm. So we all describe Mark Cuban. Is it fair to call him the face of the franchise outside of Dirk Nowitzki? Would you say? Absolutely. Okay. So he's hands-on, and he's also been known to be a control freak. So, I, again, I do not know for a fact, but I find it very hard to believe that over an 18-year period when Tredema has this history, and let's talk about some of the things that he's being accused of, propositioning women for sex, publicly fondling them, openly watching porn at his desk. So this isn't just sexual harassment. This is sexual assault. So I find it very hard to believe that during that 18 year period, we know that these staffers made complaints to HR and I'm sure that HR reached out to Mark Cuban and I'm sure there's texts, I'm sure there's emails and I feel like some of that is going to come to light. And I do think the hammer is going to fall on uh, Mark. Now, as far as punishment, my personal opinion, no, I don't think this is a Jerry Richardson situation where he needs to, um, be forced to sell because he's not the one committing the act. But I do think that he needs to forfeit a first round draft pick if that's the case. If the NBA really wants to send a message that we're deterring people from this behavior moving forward, and he was just fined $600,000 for tanking, Will. So it's got to be at least double that. So we're looking at, you know, a million plus fine and in losing that first round. Okay. But okay. Mm -hmm. Setting aside the punishment, we're largely in an mm-hmm. agreement here. I, by the way, I'm not sure that it was Tardima Usri who was watching porn at his desk. It was somebody. The report was somebody at the Mavs did that. I'm not sure it was Usri who was accused of doing that. But he is accused. It, it, of- was, it was another. It was. It was another. Um, from from what I had read in the SI piece, I thought that also fell fell under him. But uh, I could be wrong. But he is certainly um, accused of uh, public fondling, which I think the specific mm-hmm. accusation was putting his hand on a woman's thigh during a business meeting. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. He certainly propositioned, mm-hmm. yes, and and propositioned openly. I guess what I'm asking you is this: mm-hmm. if Mark knew those details that you and I now know from reading SI, I mm-hmm. agree with you. Yeah. Like he, the hammer mm-hmm. will come down if he ignored yeah. details like that. But what if he didn't know that, Molly? What if he knew? Hey, essentially, Terdima's a creep. Terdima mm-hmm. hits on everybody. Terdima, you know, is it, it tries to get every woman here to go out with him for a drink and. And propositions them. What if he knew that? Is that different to you? No, it's not okay, Will. It's well, no, 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 okay. no. Hold on. Not I didn't say it was okay. Yeah. But is it different than but, knowing the details? Like, should Mark? Is Mark? Should the punishment be different? Is that what you're asking? If, if he just is Mark's that, culpability oh, oh, this guy's different? A creepy guy at work. Yeah, is Mark's? It's oh. about Mark. Is Mark's culpability different depending on how much he knew there? In my opinion. If Mark knew, if Mark just thought that he's he's this creepy guy um, who's who's what propositioning women, who, it, it, making women feel uncomffortable at work, no, that's not okay. No, what I know Max it's not really okay. Like to say the the, fi- the fish uh, rots from the head down, meaning it's not okay. Meaning that they need to be punished because of that. Right. I guess I'm trying. You know, Molly, it's it's definitely. By the way, please hear me. 
I, it's not okay. Yeah. None of this is okay. Yeah. It's what I'm wondering is, you know, whatever was going on at the Mavericks was wrong, but mm-hmm. it's when we're talking about accountability and oversight, I start to wonder how much yep. information needs to flow up for you to say you obviously should have done something here because this really isn't in the end a Dallas Mavericks story. This is going on at numerous organizations. I would go so far as to say I'm sure it's going on at other professional basketball teams. So the question is, you know, when do you look at it and go, why didn't you act? Clearly there was let, enough let to know try. here. Let me try to sway you a little bit. Let, let's just talk There's about There's nothing to the, sway. The I'm, just, I'm just openly asking yeah. questions. Okay. Um, with the HR department, right? So it was described as when employees, you know, went to speak to the HR department, who I think we need to hold to an even higher standard. They're supposed to be setting the culture um, for workplace environment and making people feel safe, feel comfortable, et cetera. They described it as they received intimidating responses from superiors who heard the complaints. Mm-hmm. So then the other thing that really stood out to me is Buddy Pittman, who is in charge of HR, who was brought in after uh, Uthery was hired to kind of clean things up. Well, I do not understand this. He was in a cubicle, an earshot from Uthery. So how do you even feel comfortable having a conversation about a private complaint where you can't even close a door. Mm-hmm. How, how, how does Mark Cuban allow that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I hear he, you. He, he, he knows the workplace environment. Yeah, and, and the guy, Pittman, the HR department head, I mean, either purposefully obfuscated things or didn't do his job out of incompetence. He's clearly one, he's been fired, and he was one of the heads that roll. The question I think we're trying to get to, and i got to run here in just a second, Molly, yeah. does sure. Mark Cuban, how much of Mark Cuban... I mean, he's, does his head roll would mean does he force to sell the franchise? But I don't know. It, it, you know, I I just want to get into how do much do we hold Mark Cuban accountable, and how much does he need to have known and let pass to hold him accountable? That's what I'm trying to get. What at. do you think? What do you think? Will? If, I think if he knows knows all those details that we now know by reading it, yeah, he certainly should be held accountable. And I don't know what the punishment should be yet. I really don't. But it should be obviously something that comes down on Mark Cuban. If he doesn't know all the details and it's more like that situation I described, I still think he should. Yeah. I still think it's a bad workplace and you should. It's incredibly indicting that you would allow that to exist. I'm not sure it's something the NBA can punish. I guess that's where I am. On that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. One last thing, and I know you have to run. Where I give you this, we we do know the uh, Earl case need. We do know that situation, the domestic violence situation, and how he kept him on staff, right? Right. And and we we all agree. We can all assume that he knew that um, Usuri had you know questionable behavior. But it, isn't that enough for punishment? What else do we need to know at this point? I guess it if then you becomes, really want to make becomes, what's against, the punishment against domestic violence and sexual harassment and this Times Up movement, you know the times we're in right now. Yeah. The NBA has to do something. Yeah, and then I got to run my. But then it's the question of what the yeah. punishment is, right? It's because it, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's no yeah. one or no one here between you and me is saying anything is okay. Mm-hmm. It's a question of yeah, does the punishment fit the crime once we can establish who is guilty? All right, Molly, Uncharted thanks so much. territory, and they got to decide what to do. Thank, Thank you, you Molly. I really, really appreciate it. That's okay. First Take host Molly Karam on the Shell Pinsel Performance Line. All right, yesterday, Bill Polian said he got me with, who's the they you keep referring to when it comes to Baker Mayfield? Who's the they? Who's the they? I found the they. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Now ADT can help protect your family at home and on the go. Get started with ADT's best offer. An ADT starter kit and security camera installed free of $449 savings. Plus, you'll get ADT Go, the new family mobile safety app and service with 24-7 emergency response. Go to ADT.com slash podcast today to take advantage of ADT's best offer. With 36-month monitoring contract, easy pay and QSP. Early termination and activation fees apply. Additional charge for ADT Go premium services after March 31st, 2018. Certain markets excluded. Licenses available at ADT.com. Offer ends April 1st. Just reading this on Twitter from Adlam, Melly in, at Melly in San Diego. Hey, how many different times are you trying to lately defend Mark Cuban right there, Will? Um, zero, Adlam, zero. Man, I'm asking questions. I'm asking uncomfortable questions. I'm asking questions that we better answer about how much does someone have to know to be held accountable? Then, how much should they be punished for allowing a culture to exist? I'm asking questions that, look, man, if you just want to live in a world where the mob and in, 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 in consensus opinion dictates everything, you're on a good path. You're the one winning here. I'm not winning. Trying to ask questions and be nuanced and, 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 
and have an understanding of these issues, trust me, man, I'm not winning. You are. So congratulations, Adlam. You're the most virtuous among us. Climb to the top of the hill, man. There's a mob underneath you. Tell everybody how against sexual harassment you are. But the only way we, you know how to do that is tell everybody else, oh, you're okay with it. Nobody's okay with it, man. I'm going to ask some questions. I might try to be a little smarter about it. Tell me what the view is from up there on top of that hill. I'd love to know. Great news from the Wilisha. For the Wilisha. Watch us when you want. Download the ESPN app. Just tap on the Watch tab to watch full episodes of The Will Cain Show whenever, wherever. I got crushed by Bill Pauling yesterday. I said to him, hey, is Baker Mayfield, are you into his intangibles? Are they a plus or are they a minus? I said, because I think he, he could be kind of polarizing, right? That's what they're saying. And he crushed me. Who's they? Who's they? Here, this was Bill Pauling yesterday. There are those. And when I say those, I understand how generic that is, but I've read and, and, and I've talked to people who say this guy is a great motivator, leader, intangible guy. Look at what he's done in his career twice. That's what I'm talking about. There are those who seem to think he has all the intangibles. Well, you keep saying those. Define those. Well, I knew you were going to do that, Bill. I just told you. Well, I don't know. All the reading I do. Copious, copious amounts of reading. Well, who wrote the reading? <laughs> well, I don't know who wrote the reading, but I know who those are. Bill got me. I got those. He got me the time, but I got to those now. My contention was the opinions on Baker Mayfield are completely at opposite end of the spectrum. It's about who he is, you know, what his intangibles are. There are those that think he's great and those that think he's not. Those that think he's a bad dude who throws it into opposing warm-up lines, grabs his crotch, and those that think he's a motivator of men. I just couldn't name it at the time. But I got him now, Bill. Because shortly after Bill Polian was on, Matt Leinert called me. I love Baker Mayfield. I think he's fantastic. I, I really do. I, I think you look at a player who is a great leader on the field. The, the players absolutely loved him there. The coaches absolutely loved him there. Matt Leinart, big on Baker Mayfield's intangibles. Big. Big. I got one end of the spectrum nailed down. Who's those? Matt Leinart, former quarterback for USC, Arizona Cardinals. On the other end of the spectrum, those that don't think Baker Mayfield's so great. Well... A little later in the program, Booger McFarland called me. I think Baker Mayfield is just a bad dude. I'm just going to be honest. I just really? Think he's a bad dude. To me, his talent level will keep him in the league a long time. Because I- By the way, okay, he thinks he's a bad dude. Booger's on the other end of the spectrum. But as you're listening to this sound, are you 100% sure that's what Booger's saying? Because i got to tell you something. Every night I get a note, a production note from First Take. It's really, it's great. I send it to you, Rudy, and it shows you basically all the stories going on in the sports world. And I noticed one of the Will Cain show sound bites made it. It says, Booger McFarlane loves Baker Mayfield. I was like, Booger didn't say he loved Baker Mayfield, right? And then they went on to to play it, and I was like, did he? Now listen to this again, and you tell me, when he says he's a bad dude, is it a compliment, or is he saying, you know, don't, don't, don't go after Baker Mayfield? You won't know until the very end, I feel like. I think Baker Mayfield is just a bad dude. I'm just going to be honest. I just really? Think he's a bad dude. To me, his talent level will keep him in the league a long time because I think his talent level is that good. Is he ever going to be the guy that you can put him and put your franchise on his back and he'll take you to the promised land? I just think you have to have a, a certain character, a certain personality to do that. And in my opinion, I don't think he has it. And I could be wrong. I, I just don't think he has that. Did you know until that last part, I don't think he has it? Yes. Because he says he's a bad dude? It's, I don't even know how you could take it the other way. Well, the minute that the first net take note was like, uh, Booger McFarland loves Baker Mayfield, I was like, well, being a bad dude can be a compliment and an insult. Not in this case. (laughs) That's completely true. And the whole, we, uh, Nuno pointed this out. We had to cut this short because you didn't understand how to throw to it the first time. (laughs) We were talking, it was Josh Rosen. He said, you, you asked him which quarterback he wanted. He said he'd take Josh Rosen for all these reasons and then said, I wouldn't take Baker Mayfield because he's a bad dude. I'm just saying, if you pulled somebody from Slovenia, and you said, hey, what this guy's about to do on the skateboard ramp is sick. Well, he, he, did he se- wouldn't know if you're saying it's good or bad. He dissed him several times throughout I'm telling that entire you, cut. I'm telling you what you're about to watch is ridiculous. Good or bad? Am I saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you're not giving me any context clues. There's context clues. <laughs> Baker Mayfield is a bad dude. Okay, but that, is he there's good or more is he bad? to that cut. And you're not, I, I have the opportunity to listen to more of that cut. Yeah, I think by the end of the it's, 22 seconds, you realize... 
he's out on Baker Mayfield. I think Baker Mayfield is just a bad dude. I'm just going to be honest. I just really? Think he's a bad One dude. negative? To me, his talent level will keep him in the league a long time. Right now because you're I think thinking he loves him. His talent level is that good. Is he ever going to be the guy that you can put him and put your franchise on his back and he'll take you to the promised land? Negative. I just think you have to have a, a no, certain he didn't answer that question. a certain personality to do that. And in my opinion, I don't think he has it. Now, I could be wrong. There. I, I just don't right think Right there, you finally that. get it. When he's asking the question about whether or not he has the what it takes to lead your team to the promised land, he's asking that in a negative way. Baker Mayfield is sick. He's questioning him. He's ridiculous. You have no idea which way I go on that. See, Bill? I found those, Bill. Booger McFarlane at one end of the spectrum. Matt Leinart at the other. Polarizing. Now I know who to answer when Bill, Bill Pullian says, well, who's the those? Straight ahead. Doug Peterson has insulted Nick Foles. I believe it to my core. He has insulted him. He's Nick Foles should be insulted. I'm going to explain to you straight ahead. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This is the Will Cain Show. This need to be off the air. You a creep. Snoop Dogg's a fan. Yeah, you. So dumb. Weirdo. Are you? Stay right here and you will be. Devil. Get in line, Snoop. Get in line. By the way, there's three rappers ahead of you in line of people that hate me, so you're not even the first to the rap game of the hate Will Cain line. The Will Cain Show is presented by Progressive Insurance, and remember, you can listen to all three hours of your show, of my show, on your phone or on the ESPN app. Sir Mix-a-Lot's in front of you, although he's been converted. Cameron's in front of you. So, sorry, Snoop, you're late to the hate game. Hey, listen to this. Doug Peterson went on Rich Eisen's radio show, and he talked about how the Super Bowl would have played out if Carson Wentz never got hurt. I want you to listen to this, because I find this, honestly, offensive to Nick Foles. Listen, Carson Wentz was the MVP talk, you know, of the league last year. I truly believe if he's, you know, if he's healthy, and I I still feel strongly that we're probably in the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl with Carson and he's the MVP. I mean, I, I just think it's that's just the way he played last year, and, and he 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 he's a big reason. He's not the only reason, but he's a big reason why we were, I believe, eleven and two at the time. You know, playing the Rams and and won the NFC East. For me, being a former quarterback, to have two guys, uh, really three guys. I mean, throw Nate in there, but you, you're talking about Nate. Yeah, let's throw Nate in there too. You just don't bat an eye with either one of these guys. The way they prepare, the way they study, their demeanor on the field, their leadership styles. I mean, it's just uh, it's, it's a blessing to have two <laughs> guys like that, and now have. A Super Bowl MVP as your as your backup. I mean, do I need to even go on in this segment? Do I need to explain why that's insulting? <laughs> is there a single person who knows who Nate is? <laughs> do I have to explain that Nate Sudfeld is who he referenced there? Their third string quarterback? Yeah, Nate probably would have won it too. You got three great guys. Not insulting at all. Do I need to even lay out my case? Just isolate the Nate part and play that over and over. <laughs> Listen. I don't think Nick Foles is insulted. I think Doug Peterson and Nick Foles have a great relationship. I think Carson Wentz and Nick Foles have a great relationship. Tim Hasselbeck, who was on our show earlier today and argued with me about this, also said the same thing on Golik and Wingo. He said their relationship would withstand anything, even if it is insulting. Here's why it's not an issue. The relationship between the quarterbacks. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. If they didn't really care about each other, didn't genuinely like each other and want each other to succeed, then it would be a problem and it would be divisive. But because they truly want the other guy to succeed, it's not a problem for this team. I bet that's true. I bet that no one inside the Philadelphia organization is sitting there today going, what did he say? I say that. And I'll bet you Doug Peterson didn't try to insult Nick Foles. But what I'm telling you is, it is insulting. You know who's insulted? Mm-hmm. You are. You know why? I think he's been listening. Because what was one of the conversations we had after this, the Super Bowl? If... In a couple years, when you're comparing Dak to Carson Wentz, does Here this we Super Bowl count? And you're going to say no. So, so he's taking up for his man Carson. That's exactly what he's doing. That's he's what trying he's to doing. tell people that Carson Wentz has a Super Bowl. So when you count it in a couple years and you say Carson or Dak, you're like, well, Carson has a Super Bowl. Because now he's playing the Wood a game. Carson Wood a one. Exactly. That's he knows exactly when Will Cain compares exactly Dak to Carson, he's going to give Carson a Wood a Super Bowl. That's what he's doing? Exactly what he's doing. You're probably right, commercial break, Nuno. Listen. This is what he's doing. He's undercutting what was an amazing individual performance by Nick Foles. And not just one performance, but two performances. Now, I know that I doubted Nick Foles all the way through the playoffs. I know who I am. But I also know that I'm willing to tell you when I'm wrong. And boy, was I wrong about Nick Foles. Nick Foles, I just want you to hear me out. In the NFC Championship game, 
He completed 78% of his passes. Three touchdowns, no interceptions, 141 passer rating. You cannot play better than that. In the Super Bowl, he outdueled the greatest quarterback of all time, who threw for 500 yards. Nick Foles threw for three touchdowns and caught one. Now let me tell you something. You can say many things about Carson Wentz, and he's a better quarterback than Nick Foles. And over the long run, you obviously want Carson Wentz more than Nick Foles. That's not what this argument is. But you cannot tell me that it's likely Carson Wentz would have performed not only better than this, we can't say he would have performed better than Nick Foles, it's highly unlikely he would have performed as well as Nick Foles. Carson Wentz didn't have one single game this season as good as what I just laid out for you about Nick Foles. Not one game. And Carson Wentz was amazing. And as Doug Peterson points out, he was a probable MVP winner. But not one game was better than what Nick Foles did in those two games. And by the way, we can't just take the fact that Carson Wentz was an MVP candidate and project that into the playoffs in the Super Bowl. I mean, the Super Bowl, as I pointed out to Hasselbeck earlier, it's littered with regular season MVPs who choked in the big game. It's littered with them. Famous names. Joe Theismann. Cam Newton. These guys, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly threw four interceptions in the Super Bowl. Jim Kelly's a Hall of Famer. Carson Wentz is none of those things yet. So you can't just sit here and go, oh yeah, Carson would have done what Nick Foles did. That's why it's insulting to Nick Foles. Nick Foles is reality. Carson Wentz is some projection you want to make based upon how he'd played in the regular season. It completely undercuts what Nick Foles accomplished. And by the way, if you don't believe any of those arguments, here's the real nail in the coffin for you. If Carson Wentz would have been the starter for the Eagles, they would have been the favorites. I believe we know that for a fact. We had lines that said, had Carson Wentz been the starter, the Eagles would have been the favorites over the Patriots. Well, you know what happens if they're the favorites? No dog masks. No underdog status. No ethos of the world against us, Philadelphia. Which was a big part of your motivating factor. And by the way, it also changed the coaching game. Doug Peterson you know he was more aggressive, more creative, because he had Nick Foles at quarterback, because he felt like he could and needed to, versus Carson Wentz. It changed everything, and you can't just go back and go, different game plan, favorite status, because he played well in the MVP, he would have won here. What do you want to say? I can see you're chomping to get in, This just has everything to do with you being a Cowboys fan. (sighs) And not wanting to give Wentz any of the respect that he deserves. Like, this is all that is. Are, do you really believe that? Yes, you just I, I, I really you know do. That? Even if you're not, subconsciously, I think you're like, how do I, like, you, you just, that's the way it is. Like, no. you cannot give, you cannot give him the respect that he deserves. You're you automatically yourself, think Dak is on that line, and he's not. You're basically have allowed yourself to become a Twitter troll response. That's who you've uh-huh. become. A Twitter troll response. I'm tr- I'm, I'm not I can't have any real it's arguments. Real. I can't have a point of view. All I am is a Say Dak one propagandist. Nice thing about Carson Wentz. I haven't heard it. I love Carson Wentz. He gave all his offensive linemen shotguns for a present. He's from North Dakota. He's a country boy. I root for Carson Wentz. He's a good old boy. I love guys like Carson Wentz. I I would have hung out with Carson Wentz. Say something nice about Nate Sudfeld. Nate probably would have got the Super Bowl MVP too. The Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio on the ESPN app. Thank you for listening to the Will Kane Podcast. You can listen to The Will Cain Show live weekdays at 3 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on the ESPN app. The Will Cain Podcast.